All right. Welcome to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Today, I'm very excited to be hosting leadership from the W.E.B. Du Bois Movement School for Abolition and Reconstruction. Um, before we get into that, of course, do the basic things like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, support us on Patreon, um, you know, bookmark the Du Bois School website so that you can uh, learn more about the work that they all do, as we'll talk about in this, this episode. Um, and make sure you share the video, um, send it to friends and so on. And um, let's get some folks in here for this discussion. So um, the W.E.B. Du Bois Movement School for Abolition and Reconstruction is a political education program for aspiring revolutionaries and movement leaders from those communities most impacted by poverty, policing, and mass incarceration. Their home, our home, is Philadelphia, crossroads of Harriet Tubman and Octavius Cato, um, W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, Mumia Abu-Jamal and Maroon Schultz, a critical hu hub for abolitionist militancy in the past and a thriving and powerful movement ecosystem today. Through participatory and collective study of political economy, the history of global resistance movements, and the theoretical and practical aspects of social change, we aim to teach a new generation of organic intellectuals not only how to understand the world, but more importantly, how to change that. We obviously referring to the W.E.B. Du Bois School. I pulled that from their website, which y'all can check out for, for more information. So I'm really excited to welcome to the show Saudia Durant, Gio Mar, and Chris Rogers. Welcome, everybody. All right. Um, so let's get into, let's allow you all some space to introduce yourselves. There are uh, longer bios in, in the description, um, but I think it would help us to get into a little bit of the work that you all are looking to do at the Abolition School. Um, your understanding of kind of what that's for, the role you hope it can serve in building. And I, you know, it, actually, I'm not throwing my aspiration here. This is what you all say, right? A revolutionary movement in our context. You're looking to build revolutionary leaders. And so, um, you know, we're talking also, you know, we'll be talking about abolition and reconstruction in a sense of Du Bois's aspirations, um, you know, which I think we could characterize that as as revolutionary as well. So maybe... We can get into the discussion. Um, would just be for you all briefly to talk about your own stories and experiences and the place you see uh, this work, you know, filling um, and perhaps missing in some of the other efforts out there today. And Sadi, if you want to start us off, and then we can just go around. Thanks. Sure, I can kick it off. Um, so yeah, I'm Sadia, one of the coordinators and facilitators for the Abolition School uh, on an amazing team with Chris, Gio, Malkia, and our other comrade, Ant, who's unfortunately uh, incarcerated right now due to his organizing. Um, and yeah, I think in Philadelphia, there is a very beautiful and often not really well-known history around revolutionary organizing and movement building. Um, I think we have a lot of hi historic gems uh, from MOVE to Mamiya to Russell Maroon Schultz. And I think for us looking at 2020 and seeing the George Floyd uh, massive uprisings, the movements that we're building and connecting locally and nationally to oppose state violence and the way we see it impacting a lot of our cities and systems. I think a lot of organizers at that time, uh, four years ago, were thinking about, you know, we have the capacity to organize, to mobilize, to knock on doors, to talk to people, to protest. And there's a hunger and a desire for people to be able to study so that they can have political clarity about what do we mean when we say abolition? What do we mean when we say we want to dismantle these systems? What will exist when we replace these systems? And I think that's the that's the void or the gap that abolition school seeks to fill, right? For young people, for community members, for families who are very clear that the state and the system we have in place, it's not serving us, it's not feeding us, it's not meeting our material needs, it's choosing genocide before it's choosing to feed uh, our families and our folks and to fix our schools. And I think 
there's a clear appetite and desire in Philadelphia for folks to build analysis around what does it mean to be um, anti-capitalist? Are we communists? Are we socialists? What does it mean to be radical and revolutionary? And I think for us at Abolition School, we've collected a lot of resources at looking at locally the Philadelphia history and abolition and also sort of the greater analysis historically from folks like Du Bois to Marx to Mao uh, to Walter Rodney and uh, just creating a space for folks to really build and reimagine what they want to have here. Um, and I'll, I'll kick it to Gio. Yeah, thank you so much, Saudia. As you would say, plus one, plus one, plus one to everything Saudia said about what the what the school means and what what is doing. Um, I've been in Philadelphia for about almost fourteen years now. Um, not from here, from the country, um, the rural uh, lumpen. Uh, lumpen proletariat. Um, but before I came to Philly, I lived in uh, in Oakland on the one hand um, and did a lot of work and a lot of research on revolutionary movements in Latin America and Venezuela in particular. Um, and what always struck me, I meant I talk about this a lot, is the fact that, you know, when I was working with sort of revolutionary um, collectives and armed groups in Venezuela and then going back to Oakland and thinking about the legacy of the sort of um, you know black revolutionary movements, in particular the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, um, you know, I, all I saw were similarities, all I saw were connections, right? All I saw were people struggling for community control over resources, um, local um, collective decision-making and democracy, and struggling against a sort of colonial white supremacist power structure that I, you know, that I understood to be, to be global, right? Um, and, uh, you know, in, in that context, and, and particularly in the context of uh, the murder of Oscar Grant, um, uh, we, we also, you know, were engaged in a sort of mass um, wave of rebellion in Oakland that also allowed me to see, this is back in 2009 into 2010, allowed me to see the incredible power of mass struggle, right? The, uh, the fact that um, city uh, officials and elected leaders will tell you over and over and over again that don't do that, it doesn't work, don't rebel, it doesn't work, don't light things on fire, it doesn't work. Um, and, and yet that's the only thing that seems to work, right? Um, and we learned that I think very quickly in Oakland. Um, and when I came to Philly, um, this was around 2010, um, it was a very different city from what it is today. And what we've seen ever since, and I think these things are very much all connected and even go beyond the borders of the US, right? Is we see these escalating cycles of struggle um, that particularly, I mean, we helped organize in 2013 a response and a reaction to the Zimmerman verdict for the murder of, of Trayvon Martin, right? Um, and it was a very um, sad, of course, um, but also very, um, I think, you know, you know, the tone was a little defeated, right? The tone was a little low key. The tone was, we don't, we have no idea what we're going to do. We have no idea how it is that we can resist this sort of permanent violence of the police and white vigilantes. Um, but then by, you know, 2014, things were kicking off, right? Things were kicking off first in Ferguson and then in Baltimore. And then Philadelphia mobilizations began to sort of pick up and become even more radical. And all of that, I think, has led to um, you know, what, you know, and, and, you know, Saudi mentioned this was really an incredible response in 2020, a mass rebellion across the city of Philadelphia that lasted weeks, honestly, like the city was, as you know, Jared, as you all know, was occupied by the National Guard. Um, it was seen as, I think, one of the hotspots nationwide, uh, 52nd Street, which is, I think, less recognized, a sort of uh, longstanding black commercial hub of West Philadelphia um, was occupied and, and brutalized, leading to a sort of historic $9 million lawsuit against the city. Um, and, um, you know, all that's to say that in the aftermath of 2020, we're in a very, very different situation nationwide, but also uh, in Philadelphia. And as Saudi had pointed toward, that means raising questions about, well, okay, everyone's an abolitionist now. And I know this is something we're to talk about today. Everyone's an abolitionist now, what does that mean, right? And so on the one hand, I think, we need to locate those things in their moment because there are certain moments where it's like, okay, we don't need to argue about what abolition means in the year 2017, right? Um, but by 2020, I think, and 2021, these are important conversations that need to be had. Word, uh, Gio, and I'll, I think I'll come back particularly to that uprising moment in Philadelphia because that really gives you know, inspiration. It's also the first time we wrote an anthology as part of building an anthology around that which brought me on to millennials are killing capitalism for the first time. So, but to kind of start off with my story, uh, I'm from Chester, Pennsylvania, 
which is a small city outside of Philadelphia. Um, I argue that I am not from Philadelphia. I am not from here. I'm from Chester. Uh, though there's obviously, when you're only 20 minutes away from a city, people just lump you in. Um, and my experience growing up in that city was kind of, uh, my mother was an educator um, in the school district. Um, between her and her family were really connected uh, all throughout the different like churches of Chester. Uh, and my father was someone who was, you know, grew up and did a lot of community-based programs and was like very aware of like the sort of like bar scene of the city as well. So it, what it introduced me to as a young person is like these networks, um, these circuits of information and organizing and gathering. Um, and I think that's something that has followed me through today. And I think, you know, through the movement work, when I came into Philadelphia, I got to have a, a shout out to the mobilization for Mumia, uh, the MOVE organization, the sort of like veteran uh, Black revolutionaries uh, and Black revolutionary organizations um, that are here and present in the city. You start to think about, okay, all these sort of like community networks, how do you begin to think of like what their use is towards a particular strategy of building the sort of like, uh, you know, anchor points toward, you know, what the boys may call the abolition democracy, right? Um, that has been something I've been following. I, I'm an educator, uh, organized with Teacher Action Group Philadelphia, led many of uh, study groups, what we call inquiry to action groups that will begin from a particular idea. Then we will find ways to, you know, partner or uh, lift up ongoing community organizing around those issues to find ways that what can, we, what can be learned from those. Um, and certainly that comes together with my work, the Paul Robeson House and Museum, where I was the sort of like a program director and was there for about six, seven years. And that really like got me deep into the importance of community third spaces. Um, for example, like in any city, you know, and for everybody who's listening to this as well, it's like when, when organizers need to have a meeting, <laughs> where are they going? Where are the safe, welcoming spaces where you can, and particularly for free, right? That folks can kind of come together in any space, right? I, I, I think that's something that's so such a, a practical thing. Uh, and sometimes we forget about like what it means, like who's setting up the chairs, who's making sure the space has like all those sorts of the conditions for what it takes to create the space to allow these sort of conversations around strategy and organizing to continue. That kind of became a, a, a niche for me. Um, so, you know, on the other side of my work with the Paul Robeson House and Museum, you know, meeting with Geo and learning about the sort of ideas behind abolition school. Um, obviously, I've been a huge fan of Saudi is organizing in the city, Ant Smith, Malkia Oketch, folks that I have previous collaborations with and different spaces of the movement. It all came together to say, like, we need each other in this work and we have to think and think about cross cross issue, cross campaign. How do we sort of like break the silos of organizing here in the city of Philadelphia and work towards a collective strategy and think about all the, you know, critical things that go into that. You know, Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods. You know, how people approach something in West Philly is going to be different than how they approach it in North. And how do we how do we put those things on the table, but not allow them to limit us to grow the sorts of collective power needed to actually realize these uh, abolitionist freedom dreams that we have. Um, so that's what really brought me into the work and kind of sustains me in it, is the role of creating the space to container and the sense of relationship necessary to kind of build and develop collective power to challenge these things at the root. Um, and it's a, it's a weighty challenge, um, but you know, every day you wake up and try it, it teaches you something. Yeah, right on. Thank you for that. And also just quickly, folks, um, you know, Mumia's health situation is is getting pretty um, rough right now. And uh, there's a lot of um, events and organizing that is uh, picking up to, to work on, you know, revitalizing, reinvigorating, um, which is kind of a, a constant process, but a necessary process um, for his freedom. And so, you know, I just want to uplift that and drop this link because uh you know chris chris brought that up um and i was at an event last this past weekend um with pam africa and a bunch of the the move family as well as uh mark lamont hill and um cornell west and susan abuwaha and um 
uh, Gabe Bryant emceed it. And um, yeah, so anyways, folks, please tap into that. And and if, you know, and you probably have something related to it in, especially if you're in a ma major city, then there's a lot of different um, organizations that do work around Mumia locally, wherever you might be. Um, so anyways, just wanted to say that quickly. Um, maybe to expand on that, what you all talked about a little bit, um, and I know you covered you covered some of it. So maybe if there's just some gaps that you want to add or some some aspects you want to add, but um, talk a little bit about Philadelphia's abolitionist history, past and present. Um, you know where you see 2020 within that, and how your the work that you're looking to do, um, you know, in different spheres, plugs into what you're looking to do with the abolition school. And Saudia, you can or anyone, go ahead. I was, I was just stepping a little bit, you know, one of the, um, our expert on the topic, Malkia Oketch, uh, who just did an amazing project around abolitionist histories in Philadelphia, it was up at the Free Library of Philadelphia. We actually, in the, uh, for the abolition school, we presented the abolitionist time wheel, which was a sort of way of capturing these different currents of uh, movement work. Uh, but I'll try to speak to what I uh, have learned and, um, you know, company of them is, um, so much of the Philadelphia story, in particular, when we talk about the period of formal enslavement, so it's like Philadelphia simply as this route uh, or this organizing point just on the Underground Railroad, uh, which was, you know, really real, like the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, the work of William Steele, um, so many uh, people, you know, uh, came through and were part of the self-emancipation trail through Philadelphia by these networks. But uh, and also to say that some of those were like uh, uh, also part of the uh, like the Quakers are pretty you know are around here. So there's a way in which sort of like Quaker histories is also attached to that as this way of saying that uh, the underground uh, the Quakers' contribution to the Underground Railroad was their contribution to Black liberation. Well, at the same time, the Quakers were also part of defining uh, what it what it would be the modern prison, the first prison. Um, is, is uh, comes like really through Philadelphia. So I, I think that that both sides of looking at the sides of resistance um, by Black folks and the types of like the Free African Society and the type of mutual aid networks and the type of Black led organizing through churches and other spaces has always been present. Um, and at the same time, it's also been a space of innovation of the carceral state. Um, and why, like, if there's, we talk about the story of the Pennsylvania State Police, right? And the breaking up of the, uh, what was it, the coal miners? Um, like, that's also part of how this sort of like architecture of carcerality comes to be. And it arrives out of Philadelphia. And the Black community has always had, you know, numerous um, responses to, to that, right? Um, and those have been across different traditions, right? You have the more sort of like reformist, let's work inside the system to be able to challenge it from the inside um, and like this sort of like electoralism front. But then you also have, you know, um, there's also, and still present to this day, the presence of the, like the Black Liberation Army, right? And this sort of like front of like, we will shoot back as well, right? That is also present in the city of Philadelphia. And I try to say this to kind of expand um, the tendencies of how we respond to these conditions. I think sometimes we try to, they can be sometimes wrapped up into little, just like neat narratives or linear narratives of like, this is what the resistance was. But trying to recover the fullness of strategies that black folks hear and also connect it with a whole international sort of like uh, network of organizing and resistance that influences what's happening here. And Philadelphia is also speaking back to, that's kind of like what's important for us to recover in this period and certainly still on the front end of that to people like Dr. Muhammad Ahmad, um, who really sets the, who's a, to me, a, a, a set, a, a bell setter for that, pace setter for that. Of course, the work of Mumia Abu-Jamal, who's also documenting his history um, and just figuring out like, what are these different connections and how do they show up? I think it's a collective effort that we kind of still need to be doing. Um, so that's like just a quick response of what comes up for me. Right on. Yeah, go ahead, Saudi. 
And I'll just add on, I'll pick up on uh, what Chris shared around like the Black Liberation Army, because I think, um, and I really appreciate Mamiya's We Want Freedom, because he talks in his book about, he unearths, I think sometimes a lot of the missed history around how the Philadelphia Black Panther Party chapter started, uh, what were some of the challenges that they were facing under the dictatorship uh, of a fascist leader, Frank Rizzo, who we know set the blueprint for what COINTELPRO did nationally. Um, so you have folks, right, like Russell Maroon Schultz, uh, Fred Muhammad Burton, Jojo Bowen, right, Black Liberation Army members who were in West Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia, seeing the same things that we've seen with Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, right, Michael Brown's body uh, being left after being shot to death by police and left in the middle of August, right, uh, no care, no response, uh, just laugh in the middle of the street and what that image represented uh, for folks who then rioted in Ferguson and nationally, right? Russell Maroon Schultz in the 60s, right, as the different Black Panther parties are setting up in different cities, Russell Maroon Schultz saw that same experience happen in West Philadelphia, right? And then you have the uprising of folks like him, Fred Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Burton and other folks in Philadelphia who at that time, we're trying to establish and to organize sort of the same sets of self-defense work that the Black Panther uh, chapters were doing in other cities. Um, and I think looking at that history shows us who were sort of like that, uh, thinking of like abolition in the context of like slavery and Du Bois, we see in the 60s and the 70s, the context of abolition as it related to state police violence, right? What Du Bois talks about, we ended the system of slavery just to create a new system, right? Through uh, black code laws where now you're criminalized as a black person walking on the street if you don't have a job in a city where you can't get hired. Um, you see convict leasing, right? You see all these ways and then mass incarceration and targeting of freedom fighters like Russell Maroon Schultz in Philadelphia. And I think that history, um, to add on to what Chris lifted up, right, of the BLA, seeing that history, I think, shows Philadelphia as a part of that constellation, right? When you see folks like Ed Poindexter in Omaha, Nebraska, you see uh, Jalil Montekim and Noah Washington, right? Folks, Matulu Shakur, all these political prisoners that were in national coordinated strategic approaches to oppose uh, state violence, to organize people for self-defense. And I think that's sort of the, the radical legacy that exists um, in the past in Philadelphia. I think there's a lot of organizing we see uh, in the present and in the future where young people are also fighting back in schools and fighting to get cops removed out of schools. That was sort of my ushering into abolition. When I worked at Philly Student Union, we had a police free schools campaign where we talked about how young people saying they don't want cops in schools is a very radical and revolutionary idea when everything you see in mainstream society from law and order to you know the 15, 11 million seasons of law and order that put out copaganda you know, content that cops are heroes, they protect you. No, we know that there are black and brown youth in schools who see ICE, who see police, they're discriminated against, they're assaulted, uh, they're dealing with sexual violence also from school police officers. So we see all these things. Um, and I think we always have to name how abolition and reconstruction through the way that Du Bois analyzes it is deeply connected to the work of political prisoners, right? Folks who actively chose to defend themselves, to build mutual aid programs, all this stuff we're doing now is a part of that legacy, right? Of mutual aid, of self-defense, of political education, of cop watch. Um, and I think that legacy is really important in Philly. Yeah, no, and I really, you know, I really appreciate the way that Saudi and Chris Frame this as both, you know, both a place where, um, you know, where uh, repression is sharpened and developed and the sort of tactical advancement of the state, you know, that the carceral state that we confront is developing um, and also where it confronts resistance. Right. And I think Philly is a crossroads city for a lot of this. Right. Whether it's this piece, whether it's a crossroads of the north and the south. Right. Philly is very much the south of the north. Um, and it's a, a place where, again, people were not only trying to escape 
to, I mean, escape through on the Underground Railroad, um, but to, right? Like it was a space where there was a lot of radical ferment going on and a lot of different forms of organizing. This is where um, the, you know, the so-called Quaker Comet, um, Benjamin Lay, the sort of, who for people that don't know, he was a sort of vegetarian, um, you know, a Quaker dwarf, radical order and organizer um, that Marcus Redeker has written a great deal about, um, you know, and was sort of circulating in and around the, the radical abolitionist spaces of Philadelphia. Um, you know, Chris mentioned the uh, Pennsylvania State Police, the, you know, the origins of the, the modern carceral system in the penitentiary come in, you know, Eastern State Penitentiary, right, which is a, a space that is still to this day um, used, you know, in, in ways that are both, I think, maybe historically interesting and also questionable, right, as a, um, you know, but this was where the, the, the idea of the penitentiary that many of us study, if we study the history of mass incarceration, is developed um, and has developed outer reform. Right. This is one of the main things we learn about it is that um, people were trying to make incarceration more humane and they did the opposite. Right. Um, you know, and a lot of this had to do with the sort of progressive sentiments in the city, which is something I think that is crucial and, and something to, to, to bear in mind. One thing that um, is really interesting to me is the way that, you know, and again, moving here um, more than a decade ago. Um, it, it was sort of like a breath of fresh air because it seemed as if also um, as a result of this long history, um, what we could, and I think what we increasingly call the politics of representation was, you know, like had less traction, right? Like this is a city where there was black police in the 1890s, right? This is a city where um, a, a black mayor dropped a bomb, you know, on, you know, on black West Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, even just in organizing and doing police organizing, like we're organizing against the murder, you know, of, you know, Alexander Spencer, he's killed by black cops, you know, like, and, you know, this is very much the way things have been. And I think communities know that, right? Um, it's not to say that there's no traction, right? We see if for people that have been paying attention, um, you know, it, it's difficult to say that representation politics didn't play a role in the recent mayoral election, um, which, you know, elected a, a pretty conservative and reactionary um, black woman um, to be our new mayor, which is a situation that we're now going to have to confront. Um, but I think it's a city where a lot of these, you know, that has been through a lot of these questions, right? That is not going to um, fall for um, a lot of the old kind of symbolic solutions. And so you've got this city where, you know, again, West Philadelphia is by some measures, the most progressive radical district in the entire country, right? Um, but it's developed in a city that's got a deep backbone of white supremacy that's built on the incorporation of particularly Irish and, and Italian ethnic whites into whiteness, right? And this is a violent incorporation, as Saudi pointed to, um, when Frank Rizzo comes to power, right? So the Black Panther Party is immediately confronting some of the most brutal repression you could imagine, you know, nationwide uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and there's a reason for that. Right. Like it's a space where these struggles are playing out, where the, you know, the red squads that Rizzo develops. Yeah, this is the early COINTELPRO. Right. This is the early strategy of what it means to destroy movements. And we still, you know, they call them civil affairs today. Um, but those were red squads. Those were squads that were developed to undermine, weaken, infiltrate and destroy um, political movements because there were so many movements because those movements were so uh, uh, were so powerful. Um, and of course, we see this dynamic, this sort of opposition of radical organizing and the sharpening of the tools of repression um, rolling right through the present, right? Um, what was the Trump phrase, right, that the liberals loved, which is like Philadelphia, so bad things happen in Philadelphia, right? This is not a, this should not be a statement about liberalism, right? It's a statement about, you know, sort of radical organizing, right? The kind of radical organizing that's always been here. And that's why you have the Trump Department of Justice targeting movements um, and sending people to federal prison, right? Including, as Saudi mentioned, our comrade, our team member, our facilitator, our friend, Ant Smith, who's gonna spend the next 10 or 11 months in federal prison, right? That was Trump, right? That started that, and it was Biden as well that continued it. So it's a city that's very much a, um, you know, that, that's very much um, in the middle of these questions, right? And confronting a, you know, a kind of institutionalized democratic party um, that is very, very conservative, you know, it has been. Um, and so it's, you know, it's an interesting place for us to be uh, doing this work and where this work I think is essential. Right on. I realize like we're kind of moving through this conversation a little bit with the, with it implied in terms of what you all are actually doing at the abolition school. And so I think maybe we should take a moment here for 
you all to talk about that a little bit. And I just want to direct folks that the Instagram that's at the bottom of the screen um, is related to um, Aunt Smith, who we've been discussing, who has worked, been a staff member with you all and is currently um, in political imprisonment. Um, and so if folks want to, to follow that, to get involved, to connect, um, that's a great place to do so. So anyway, um, but yeah, maybe one of you or all of you want to take a moment just to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the what of the abolition school. Yeah, I can just say a couple of things quick, and then I'm sure people have many more things to say. Um, abolition School, the Du Bois Movement School um, for Abolition and Reconstruction, um, came out of uh, you know conversations within um, movements in the abolitionist sort of ecosystem in Philly, which is important to say again is a big ecosystem. It's a lot of movements, a lot of sort of nonprofit spaces, a lot of radical organizers, especially since 2020, um, doing abolitionist work in very different ways, mutual aid work, again, nonprofit work, intellectual work, organizing work. Um, and again, one of the questions that we hinted at at the very beginning was this question of, well, everyone's an abolitionist, what does that mean, right? Um, and that plays out in very practical ways, because it's like, what does it mean to be someone who's dedicated to organizing for abolition? And these questions um, were coming up in, you know, um, you know, in a, you know, a clear lack of political development of some younger people, like a lot of us come out of political organizations or political parties or um, those kinds of spaces where political education is taken for granted and it's done, right? There's a structure in place to uh, bring people up to speed. Um, and yet we, you know, we came out of a moment where uh, a whole bunch of people are swept into abolition with very little political education. Like they're interested in it, they're down, they showed how down they were, um, you know, on, you know, in late May and early June of 2020. Um, and yet what we want to do is reinforce that spirit, reinforce it with understanding, reinforce it with study, collective study. And so what the school does is to engage in um, political education that is, you know, we often refer to four principles that's participatory, that's abolitionist, that is intersectional, um, and that is uh, internationalist. Um, did I say internationalist twice? <laughs> okay, abolitionist, internationally, and yeah. So, uh, and, and, you know, and all of those principles apply to what we study, but they also apply to how we do that study, right? In other words, the space we create is an intersectional space. The place that we, the space that we create is a internationalist space that brings together people from different struggles across the city, from different communities across the city, and seeks to develop on the one hand, individual organizers, people that want to organize, people that want to understand better the world that we confront and how to change it, um, brings them into conversation with each other to build collectively and collaboratively and build like, a, you know, what I understand is like a connective tissue between these movements um, for, for moving forward. Yeah, Chris or Sadia, you want to add anything on to that? Right, go ahead, Sadia. Yeah, I'll just plus, plus, plus uh, to everything Gio said. Um, and yeah, I think for us, being able to start with Du Bois's Black Reconstruction is like the foundation of how we, you know, assess questions around what do we need to dismantle. I think it's been really helpful for us as a team and also for the folks that we're holding these sessions for. Like there's a lot of uh, conversations that we hold through political education from different authors around what's sort of the culture that we see ourselves existing in, like the very anti-intellectual, anti-revolutionary, anti, -revolutionary, anti uh, communists, like what's the culture that we're in? How does it make us feel? How do we navigate it? Um, and then what's sort of the counter culture that we want to combat that with? What's the revolutionary culture that we want to combat that with? And I think Du Bois, being able to study folks like Du Bois, Walter Rodney, uh, Angela Davis's Our Prisons Obsolete, I think has been incredibly helpful to be able to center the viewpoint and the analysis of A, Black writers, Black creators, uh, Black intellectuals, right? Folks who are of the working class, for the working class, uh, folks who have been focusing through the analysis and the lens point of the most exploited classes, I think has been so helpful. Um, looking at Du Bois, right, and his super sarcastic, but also very serious, you know, way of contextualizing what were the different sets of interests that were interacting with one another when we see the civil war happening, right? We know that in traditional education, we often get the narrative of, you know, white people did this thing that wasn't that great. 
Abraham Lincoln said, white people, we're going to be better. We're going to free the slaves. Dr. King said, you know, all those, like all those very smart, uh, romanticizing, liberal, and also just completely uh, like nonsense narratives that we get indoctrinated with from children through adulthood. I think for us being able to unpack and unlearn those narratives with looking at like his chapter on the general uh, strike, seeing enslaved people actively deciding and choosing how they were going to fight and coordinate for their freedom. Folks seeing the different sense of interest, going to fight against one another and seizing opportunities that came up to fight, to become free, uh, to drop their tools and leave the plantations. And I think for us being able to have a safe space that's not very uh, often you know, in larger societies, being able to have space to assess that and to see as working class people, uh, the conflicts between racial interest and class interests clashing, I think has been really beautiful with helping people identify the similarities in present day, right? What happens if we're working for corporations or companies who aren't willing to say free Palestine? What happens when we're working in places that exploit us, that force us to work millions of hours a day, we don't have space to think critically about what's happening to us. So I think being able to look at folks like Du Bois and being able to have the time to read difficult texts that schools we know are working incredibly hard, right? Republican fascists are working incredibly hard to make book access um, very, very limited if not impossible, when they reflect Black and Brown working class folks. Um, so I think having spaces like this um, is our way of building space to build community within movement, to foster curiosity and learning, um, and to really see that what we're going through is not, it's new in nuanced ways, and it's also all the symptoms that have been going on for decades and decades. Yeah, and just to close up from the wonderful things my comrades have shared, uh, in terms of like the practical, pragmatic things, like it's a 12 week uh, series or uh, abolition one-on-one -on -one that we're working on and kind of developing out. Um, and we're going through our second iteration of it now. Uh, our hope is as we kind of sharpen it and feel more confident and we might be willing to talk more about the specific pedagogy, but some of those weeks, uh, you know, have titles such as Marxism 101, history, uh, many paths to socialism, Black Reconstruction Part One and Part Two. What is the state? What is revolution? Decolonization and Third World Revolution. And just kind of naming some of the topics that are influencing the sort of like interactive uh, study uh, that we're having. You know, once a week for uh, twelve weeks with about thirty to thirty-five organizers at a time. We also have uh, special topics this semester uh, that we added. And I don't know. I'm, I came out of education. I'm going with semester. I'm. Just, <laughs> but uh, I'll say um, we have the Breaking Police Power uh, Working Group, right? And really trying to bring people across different, uh, you know, different campaigns, different neighborhoods to talk about, uh, you know, a, a challenge uh, against the FOP and also continue to build up, as, you know, Gio mentioned in this moment that we're headed into with a sort of like a, a conservative reactionary new administration. Um, uh, we additionally have the uh, the Memory Work Lab, uh, which Malkio Ketch is, is leading alongside their new uh, Upstart Memory Workers Guild, which is a collective that is really dedicated towards looking at the intersection between, you know, a, a cultural um, a work, a cultural practice, archiving cultural practice, and political practice, um, and thinking of like what experiments and opportunities do those two things intersect. You know, Tony K. Bambara, who also spent a lot of time in Philly, says the role of the culture worker is to make the revolution irresistible. And certainly that presence is still here today. Um, and then our Black Reconstruction Study Group, which is also going to be kicking off. Um, so those are kind of like the three. We're also uh, really appreciate Gio and the uh, comrade partners that he has looking in South Philly, thinking about how we take Abolition 101 into uh, Spanish as well and focus on the many different communities that we can reach. And I think, you know, all together, you know, I think one of the other sort of like peer organizations I was just looking at this mun municipalism series. Uh, that I see uh, Kazin Kazimbe Balagoon is also a, a part of. And this sort of idea of like 
the specificity of Philadelphia and the different organizations and formations that can be built here. How can we can we really create a block? And I don't mean just a voting block of like it's not just like some you know, uh, electoral thing, but a, a a block that is saying how do we advance? Uh, towards this abolitional, abolitionist world? And what does it look like in true practice, right? Um, what are the type of housing justice and um, uh, uh, work uh, uh, against the carceral state and um, uh, sort of mutual aid work, like all these things kind of go together. So how do we begin to, uh, as Barbara Ransby might say, like political quilting, how do we build this quilt of all this um, action and strategies um, and relationships to kind of add up to something more than just the sum of its parts. Absolutely. I'm going to pull up a couple affirmations from the chat. So nonsense narratives, Sadia. Um, and then um, just, you know, peace to Hiram Rivera, of course. Thanks again for our conversation last week. Uh, um, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed, uh, Max Stanford is an absolute legend in the Black freedom struggle. Um, and then Quaker anarchists talking about the mixed bag of the Quakers, you know, um, which is absolutely true. Something we had an interesting conversation, which I'd like to have them back on, but Michael and Zohara Simmons, who also have a lot of, uh, Philadelphia history themselves, but work with, um, American friends service committee for a number of years and had a lot of struggle in that space, um, to get folks from just, a kind of liberal politics of peace to like, what is, how do you su get support for anti-colonial revolutions through a space like, you know, the AFSC, which has more of a pacifist, you know, framing. So anyways, interesting stuff. Um, so I, piggybacking off of what you were just talking about, um, y'all reference a couple of these things. And so we'll kind of continue the conversation here. Um, it, one thing that I do think it's really important and it's been a draw to me of abolition for, you know, quite a long time is that I think it's really important for any revolutionary struggle to have a basis within the culture and the history of the society that it emerges from. And I, I see abolition as um, an attempt to do that. Um, and so to give an example, right, if we were talking about Amilcar Cabral in Guinea-Bissau, um, you know, it wouldn't be just him saying, OK, I'm going to teach you state and revolution and 10 days that shook the world and saying, hey, we need to do exactly this thing because it wouldn't have worked with the conditions of their society. Right. With the conditions of colonialism specific to um, Guinea Bissau. And so they would have to, you know, work from these frameworks and figure out how do we articulate this? How do we, you know, meld our own history and struggle um, and what we have available to us um, and the ways that we can struggle in this setting into this kind of framework. And so um, obviously he is an example, right, of somebody who was in Marxist and communist reading groups in Portugal with other African revolutionaries. Um, so I'm not also saying that we want to by any means say don't study that stuff. You all, as you just laid out, study that stuff along with other things. Um, and think about how do we, um, you know, use this in our own context. And so Black Reconstruction obviously is a really important text within the U.S. context, as you all have started to lay out, um, that we might think about as, try, you know, Du Bois's attempt in some ways to take these frameworks and analyze, um, you know, history through them. So how important is all of this to you and your understanding of of abolition and what you all want to do? And what are some of the revolutionary currents, um, you know, of the stories of our history, history and context that you draw from? Anybody can lead us off. Gio, you want to start us off? Sure, I can say a couple things. I mean, I think the way you frame the question is really good, and it speaks to two very, very different things, both of which are, you know, bigger questions about abolition, and both are questions about what what, what we do, right? Um, I think in the broadest sense, and, and this is where the Black Reconstruction piece comes in, um, it's a question of the fact that revolutionary movements begin from where the people are at, right? And they begin from the, um, and, and that means a lot of different things, right? It means they begin from the actual conditions that people are living in, right? One thing I love about Cabral is that he says like, listen, let's look at the terrain 
Um, and by that, he means like the literal terrain, like let's look at the soil, let's look what grows in the soil, but also let's look about the different, you know, because here's someone who's trying to build a revolutionary movement between two very different colonized spaces, right? Like, um, you know, Cape Verde and, you know, Guinea-Bissau being like very different, um, having very different relationships to the colonial core, um, different demographics as a result, looking at that terrain and think about where does the revolutionary movement grow from? And this is what so many great revolutionary third world thinkers do, right? This is what Jose Carlos Mariategui does when he looks at Peru and says, I'm a Marxist, I'm a communist, but there's no proletariat here. There's like, in the technical sense, there's no large, um, you know, working class waged, um, you know, proletariat. And so what is there, right? There's a large peasantry, there's a large indigenous population that still lives according to, uh, you know, traditional collective structures. How do we build a revolutionary movement based on those ingredients, right? This is what Walter Rodney does when he takes Marxist categories and looks at Africa and says, you know what? We didn't pass through the stages of historical development that traditional Marxism teaches us, right? Like we never developed a capitalist stage. We hardly, we didn't develop a, a slavery stage because our people were stolen to engage in slave labor elsewhere, right? We have a combination of feudal and again, indigenous collective, you know, structures and how do we build a revolutionary movement out of that, right? So that's it, like, it's a general impetus, right? And again, it comes from third world revolutionary Marxism in particular um, because these are movements um, that we're, we're trying to use Marxist categories to explain things that Marx himself had not sought to explain, right? And that always requires a process of translation. It always requires a process of looking at local conditions, beginning from those local conditions. This is why Mariategui in Peru, his book is his very famous book is called Seven Interpretive Essays on Peruvian Reality, right? Because the reality is the starting point, right? Our reality, um, and, and this is where the Du Bois piece comes in, is one that is shaped by particular histories, right? Particular histories of a very binary understanding of race and, you know, racialization of slavery um, alongside indigenous genocide and the way that those pieces were fit together, right? And the way that they emerged dynamically in the history of struggle around, around and against slavery, right? So it makes perfect sense that on the one hand that Du Bois is stretching Marxism to think about these questions, right? He's saying, if you look at Black Reconstruction, right? Like this is like it's the Bible, right? If you look at it, he says the Black worker, right? That is a controversial statement for traditional Marxists, right? Because those are slaves, right? Um, that's a different relation of production, arguably different mode of production in certain kind of analyses. He says the general strike, right? He's saying these things that do not generally qualify as workers, general strikes, traditional working class categories, um, they fit, right? So he's stretching Marxism in that direction. At the same time, he's stretching our language toward abolition and toward reconstruction and toward thinking about what these things uh, sort of mean. And the way I think that this very importantly speaks to things I know that we're going to talk you know, more about throughout this conversation about why abolition? Why do we talk about abolition? Why is the school called abolition and reconstruction? Why is it not the sort of, uh, you know, Philadelphia, West Philadelphia communist collective school, right? Um, it, you know, and it's got everything to do with the fact that, A, we begin where people are at. B, we, we speak the language that people speak, right? And that's, I mean, that's just, that is just good revolutionary work, right? That's where, what you do, right? If you come in speaking a language that a small group of, uh, you know, um, intellectuals have developed that doesn't resonate with people, then you don't get very far when it comes to organizing. This is something that was very, you know, that, you know, for me in doing Latin America work in particular comes up a lot around religion, right? I was not a religious person. And yet, the language of religion is so central for many Latin American revolutionary struggles. And, and you know, like a truly dialectical understanding is one that understands that these concepts gain different meaning when they get filled with different content, right? Um, so a sort of, you know, uh, Latin American revolutionary saying the blood of Christ, you know, saying, you know, like we, um, you know, a, you know, engage in a Christian understanding of what it means to serve the poor and that serving of the poor means engaging in revolutionary warfare against a corrupt system um, that betrays the meaning of the Bible, right? Like that is a revolutionary statement that doesn't resonate with me because of where I'm from and how I grew up, but that's where you begin from. That's how you begin to understand these questions. And so um, that's all to say without going all the way with the conversation that abolition and reconstruction are anchored in US history in a certain sense, although these are global histories as well, right? Um, and that that involves starting from that point and understanding the way that they connect to um, and engage with and plug into broader questions of revolutionary organizing worldwide. Love that. 
And I would just add on to say, like, um, I think one of the um, underrated or un like under disgusting is like how important it is to 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 know engage in culture, right? And I think of like the legacy of Milk Carter Brow, PIGC, and like that sort of depth of understanding of culture, of the sort of like day everyday experience. Uh, uh, and how that's reflected in our strategies to kind of have this more emergent, you know, sort of like learning where, yes, we are reading, like we're deeply committed to study. Uh, we're deeply committed to uh, engaging with historical texts. Um, but it's also important that we're also deeply engaging with our own experiences and allowing that to, you know, uh, show a bit of the way as well. Um, you know, some couple things come up for me, like Aime Césaire's, you know, letter to the French Communist Party announcing his resignation, that, you know, we want a Marxism and com communism in service of Black people, and we're trying to figure out what that means. Um, I think, like, that that figuring out process, I think, is is the one of the most important parts of the collective struggle, right? To kind of move from this space of just inheriting sort of, like, the, the text and uh, tactics of, of history to being able to claim what our strategy is and what our vision is and, and be really specific about it uh, so that we get beyond just the sort of like terms or frames of abolition and get into the specifics of what sort of institution, organization, campaign demands actually make up an abolitionist vision. Um, it's, a, it's a different level of, of specificity and it comes along with it with a with a different level of engagement, of comradeship, uh, to be able to even envision the possibilities for, for, for what they are. Um, and so like another person who comes up, George Lamming, someone I spent a lot of time studying, um, it says like, sometimes we have this, uh, you know, theory in our heads, but it's ahead of our feet or ahead of our stomach. Like it's not what we're eating. <laughs> we're importing theory onto something that we could just be looking outside and realizing that we live. And I think part of abolition school is trying to get our study to match that walk, right? What does you know collective reflection look like? How can we you know uh, uh, think about um, the tools for um, strategy building across a, a city, across camp? Like these are the types of things that we can get, begin to imagine just beyond what our individual commitments are into a space of what a collective line is. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to say, <laughs> but the execution of that is what separates, you know, so much of um, uh, the realizing of these movement goals. Um, and I think that's a struggle. It's a worthy struggle, uh, certainly a challenge, but uh, that claim to like, wh wh at what scale do our movements work at? what abolition school is doing, as we talked about Philadelphia, is like, what does it mean to build a, a, a revolutionary organic intellectuals at the scale of how do we transform the city? And recognizing that transforming the city cannot just be only what we see here, but is influenced by a, a world of movement. So how are we uh, remaining in conversation and engagement and solidarity with those struggles and allowing that to influence the type of opportunities, experiments, um, and actions that we're that we can do every day. Yep, all that to everything, amazing. I definitely relate to a lot of the revolutionary influences that my comrades named. I think the only others that I would lift up are like the first two books I ever read in college in FM studies was The Souls of Black Folks by Du Bois and Malcolm X's um, autobiography. And it feels really important to name those two reading pieces in particular, because I think they carry a lot of the, I think the culture of the abolition school of looking through the lens of what anti-Blackness and anti-working class rhetoric, like how we internalize it, as black and brown and oppressed people, how do we internalize it individually? Because we live in a hyper individualized capitalistic state that teaches us that um, having connection and close ties and relationship building to one another, that it's not valuable, that it's not important. And I think uh, those two authors, along with Asada and her autobiography, I think reflect a lot of the 
a lot of what we seek to organize as a part of the culture we hold in abolition school is like, we know we internalize a lot. And I think Chris mentioned this, right? But we internalize so much of our conditions without fully being aware of it or even having the capacity to be aware of it. And I think having a space to look at the writings of folks we put on our, you know, our nightstand or, you know, when we go to bed at night and we look at our altars of like the great folks who have passed away, who have transformed the lives of folks they would never meet, you know, who who uh, died and were murdered and killed, right? Thinking of how their reflections help us to feel connected in our reflections feels really important. I think the only other influence I want to name too is that I think, um, at least for me, because I come from like education, organizing in schools. And for me, it feels important to also lift up like Ella Baker, someone who we talk about building a space for organizers, right? For community members and also for folks who are doing the door knocking, folks who are writing petitions, folks who are hitting the pavement. And I think for me, it feels really important um, to name Ella Baker as a huge influence for me because she is someone who has talked a lot about, you know, often in movements, there are challenges around fostering group-centered leadership models, right? That we often see um, a very char charismatic leader, a very charismatic intellectual speaker, like her um, critiques of Dr. King at a time where no one could tell Dr. King he was doing anything wrong for the civil rights movement. Her analysis was being very critical and sharp around, yes, it's great to have leaders, but that's not more important than providing space for groups to make decisions for groups to be practicing and organizing uh, and testing their organizing methods together. And I think what she did in the model in the South, in North Carolina with SNCC, right? And seeing models of folks, right? Stokely Carmichael and other folks started out often doing college campus organizing, right? That's how they're, they got their foot in the door very often with doing organizing uh, in structured ways and then moved often into more radical and revolutionary spaces. And I just think it's important as we foster space to make sure we create as many entry points as possible so that no one is getting turned away in organizing, right? That we keep as many doors open as possible to bring folks into movement. Mm -hmm. And I just want to just really quickly, you know, underline something that I think is coming up in all of this, um, you know, in whether it's the educational piece and the question of the spaces we create. Um, and it, you know, particularly in, in response to what Chris was saying about, you know, Amy Césaire's resignation letter from the Communist Party, right? He says, because one thing he says in there is, you know, um, is that we need to build a universal that is rich with all particulars, right? Um, and he thought, and he's a communist, right? He's a Marxist, but he had to leave the party because he felt like the party was coming from the level of the universal and saying, here's these universal categories that have to fit the reality. And he's like, no, we have to start from the reality and build up, right? And what that meant for him was, you know, black experience mattered, right? It's the same reason Richard Wright is struggling with these questions, right? Um, black experience matters, um, that black experience and, you know, the struggles of black communities are class questions, right? Are questions of class struggle, right? Not the other way around, what is the class struggle and then how do we map it onto the black community, right? Um, you know, how do the, the experiences, as Saudi was just talking about, that people bring into the room, and this is why we do participatory work, how are those experiences part of how, you know, the the gathering of these particulars together, together to begin to talk Talk about what a universal framing would look like, right? And so again, this is all gets to these questions of what kind of categories we bring to the to, to the table, what our framework is, whether we're talking about abolition or socialism or communism, right? And how we do that work. So I just wanted to underline that piece as is below a lot of these things. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, it took me a sec to come off mute. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead one question of mine to get to another one, because we have a couple of good ones in the chat, too. And I'm going to try to make time that we can get to those as well so we can hear questions from the audience. And um, but folks, if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat also. And we'll we'll get to what we can. I think we got about max about 45 more minutes we can go here. So um, anyways, uh, specifically, I want to take a little time to talk about decolonization and anti-imperialism. Um, I think this is something, obviously, as we're thinking right now about, you know, Palestine, about Gaza, um, but it, it's something that comes up a lot in different ways, you know, because the question of abolition can, you know, bring up, um, you know, our there's the slogan, and I think we talked to you about this before, Geo, of all cops are bad, right? And there's the question of, do people 
is our orientation in the United States going to be the same against, uh, you know, so-called like the police in Cuba, right, for instance, versus how we might see, uh, you know, a struggle against the police in the United States. And this is obviously complicated. We're not saying that every instance of state repression is good within a you know, socialist country or something like that. Um, but also that, you know, we, we need to be able to have some lens or framework, too, of how we're analyzing these things. And it's not just flat the same everywhere all across the world. Um, and so, you know, some there are some abolitions who I think are strictly speaking, you know, anti-state, anti-police, anti-prison, anti-carceral, right? And it's just sort of all across the board. It's we might, you know, say it's a moral like position for them. Um, and I think that as you're talking about, you know, Marxism and, and communism and uh, national liberation struggles and things like that, obviously that complicates, you know, those discussions because, you know, these states have their own historical processes and momentum and, and things like that that they go through. Um, and and in some cases, you, you can have in certain instances where the anti-state or anti-police struggle might actually be a very conservative or reactionary thing in a certain context, right? Um, and obviously that is dependent on analyzing the specific conditions there and, and really knowing what's going on. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I think that there's there's a lot of things that we could bring up um, within this. You know, there's discussions, for instance, of, you know, to talk about Palestine for a, an, a minute. You know, some folks bring up examples of Palestinian anti-blackness or the, the circumstances of Afro-Palestinians. Um, in some cases, it might be um, discussions about, um, you know, like feminist critiques, right, within Palestinian society or queer critiques within Palestinian society. And, you know, there's a way that obviously these these are meaningful and important critiques, all of them. They, they all have, uh, they're all something that Palestinian society has to, to reckon with and to, to move forward. But at the same time, sometimes critiques like this can be weaponized to sort of limit our solidarity with people in struggle and people that are have genocide being enacted at them at the same time right and so i'm interested in how you all wrestle with some of these kind of contradictions um as you think about abolition alongside these other sort of you know politics I, i'll give a second before geo goes because i want geo to go on this one but i'll say quickly uh, Robin D.G. Kelly's Solidarity is Not a Marketplace, uh, an amazing interview that I like truly recommend. Uh, it is a um, certainly the this question is something that we should always be wrestling with in terms of our struggles. Uh, but the sort of like lessons of focusing on our common resistance uh, rather than the sort of like prescription of common suffering. Um, is something that I do hold dear. It's a place I trust and I'm trying to trust it for a while and allowing it to sort of like guide what my praxis is. So I hope that gives enough space for Gio to <laughs> Gio lead on this one and I'll have to follow up. No, I mean, I think there's a huge questions, right? Um, you know, the question of uh, decolonization in relation to abolition, the question of Palestine, which one of the really great things about the abolition school seminar in the fall is that we started and then like a week later, October 7th happened. Um, and so it quickly became a space where, on the one hand, people were struggling to uh, use our analysis that we were, graft, you know, crafting collectively to think about what's happening, right? Um, of course, October 7th was an incredibly historic moment. Um, and it's a moment that also, like, revealed the fact that, you know what, the Palestinian question is about decolonization, first of all, um, which is... You know, this was the first moment where that became the common framing for for Palestine, right? Like it's always been in the background, but for the most part, people want to talk about apartheid or want to talk about this or that. You know, for the you know, like now decolonization is the is the framing, but it's also an abolitionist moment, right? Like as Mario Barghouti put it, like October seventh was a jailbreak, right? Because we're talking about the way the settler colonialism relies on carceral infrastructure, always has relied on carceral infrastructure of containment, of forced labor, of mass genocide, of displacement, right? These are, you know, carceral structures. And so the way, and, and that's part of, I think, what guides what we do is to say that abolition and decolonization go hand in hand, 
right? Um, and, you know, we need to understand their relationship to each other, right? They're both also frameworks that have become very mainstream at the same time, right? Everyone's decolonial, everyone's abolitionist. Um, but what does that mean, right? Like you got deans of decolonization in universities, right? But the universities are not giving any, any land back to uh, sort of like indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous communities or people. So, so we have these questions that are raised about abolition also being raised about uh, decolonization. One of the main questions people had after October 7th was, well, uh, all right, where are all the anti-colonial academics at, right? Who want to talk about decolonizing, but when they see it happening, right? When they see uh, October 7th was land back, right? Like October 7th was settlements that have been stolen from Palestinian people um, being emptied and being returned, you know, like, I, of course, it's more complicated than that, but but we need to, you know, understand a certain kind of baseline, I think. So we do a few things, I think, at the school, right? One is to say abolition and decolonization, you know, uh, are, are fused to each other in part because what we begin from is a study of where they came from, like where capitalism comes from, where colonialism comes from, um, you know, where slavery comes from in relation to colonialism, right? Slavery is born of colonialism, modern slavery. Um, and it assumes different forms in different spaces. The U.S. is very particular and gives rise then to an abolitionist framing, right? Um, but at the same time, the foundations are very, very similar. What capitalism is trying to get out of uh, slavery um, in the United States and forced labor elsewhere is very, very similar, right? The um, attempt to, on the one hand, extract resources from colonial spaces, to extract labor from colonized and enslaved people, and to displace people and steal land. These are all part of a, a broader capitalist, you know, colonial project, right? And I think we need to understand that. Thankfully, Afro-pessimism seems to be kind of waning, um, but, um, f you know, for a period, and, you know, you still see some of this out here, there's this idea that these are completely different questions, right? That the struggles of Black Americans, and Americans specifically, are completely separate from the struggles of even Africans, right? And the struggles of Latin Americans, of other third world sort of colonized people, right? Um, and, you know, even taking this to the point, like the, the the logical conclusion of this is some of the really reactionary sort of like ADOS and like, you know, um, American descendants of slaves logic, which says we work for ourselves only and not even for Caribbean, you know, enslaved people, not even for other sort of communities. Um, so what I think we try to do is to understand, and this is part of the internationalism piece, right? Is to say, you no, know, we, we are in this tradition of revolutionary internationalism, which says these struggles work in conjunction with each other. That doesn't mean it's easy, right? And I think a lot of the Afro-pessimist critiques of coalitions and anti-blackness in coalition spaces, absolutely true, right? hundred um, percent. You know, there's definitely, and you can say there's anti-blackness in Arab communities, hundred percent. And you can say there's anti-Arab racism in black communities, right? Like, and, you know, like, you know, Islamophobia across American society, right? And we need to think about what it takes for us to study jointly and to understand how to build through and build past this and understand the kind of unities that we can develop, uh, you know, in sort of like in and across revolutionary communities. That was beautiful. Yeah, Sadia. I'll make my response quick. Um, definitely appreciate all the gems that Gio asked, um, answered with. I was just going to add that I think a part of, I want to lift up a part of the study that we did uh, specifically led by Ann Smith, which is looking at uh, Franz Manon's uh, Wretched of the Earth, where I think he challenges and lifts up, I think, what's a very difficult and complex conversation around abolition um, to the point around, like, what does it take to decolonize, right? And Fanon talking about if colonialism by virtue and foundation is an act of violence explicitly, then it would take nothing but violence then to help for people to decolonize their systems. And I think that felt like a, an incredible analysis that Ant would lift up in us and thinking about the work that we're doing and being very clear about who do we see overseas that we're on the same exact side on uh, when it comes to fighting against the state, fighting against white supremacy, uh, fighting against imperialism, being very clear that the repression that Black people have experienced historically Right, Malcolm X in the 60s, right, saw this similarly happening in Palestine and had that analysis that it's very important for us to build black and uh, black and brown solidarity across the seas. And I think um, it's really important for us to constantly combat a lot of the liberal narratives that we see coming out, the divisive nature uh, of the way the state will kind of like dangle a carrot to get exploited people to fight over resources or even to fight over recognition of being exploited. I think that's a 
a very dangerous rabbit hole that we constantly see ourselves as people being pushed into. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly name too is that I think for us on the question of criticism and critique, I think for us, uh, a big piece of how we started this semester was talking about why we study and bringing in pedagogy of the oppressed and Paulo Freire and looking at it's critical for us as people who want to be educated, who want to learn, and contrary to what traditional education teaches us, which is we're supposed to just bank information and receive it and not question it, a big part of, I think, our piece around analysis and critique, right, is that criticism and critique don't have to fundamentally, uh, doesn't have to fundamentally be negative. I think it matters. Um, are there contradictions that feel, uh, I think, what Ma would say, like antagonistic or non antagonistic? Are we fundamentally disagreeing on our values and our political analysis? Or are we wrestling with ideas that we don't have answers for and that requires pushback respectfully or disagreement or asking clarifying questions? Like we offer uh, community agreements as a practice of like, hey, we can question our ideas and that doesn't mean that we're you're attacking someone by virtue unless it feels like um, an antagonistic contradiction. And I think uh, for us, any study space should be about critically thinking and questioning and analyzing, uh, pushing back on one another for the purpose of us all building political clarity, alignment, and to know that when we're studying, that's how you show up in a powerful way, right? Is to not be powerless and not engage in the process, but to feel powerful to ask questions and engage. Beautifully said. And I'll just say quickly, so I dropped the link to um, the the interview that Chris had referenced with Robin D.G. Kelly, Solidarity is Not a Market Exchange. Quick self-plug and plug for collective study. So we did an episode with Robin D.G. Kelly. Uh, it's an interview about the interview, so it's it's pretty meta. But if you um, <laughs> if you uh, do read that piece, and, and that was a process of a study group that we did reading that piece together and then coming up with questions and then interviewing him about it. So um, anyway, shout out to, to Collective Study as a great space to actually have real conversations about these contradictions. And as you as you say, I mean, I appreciate the reference to Mao too and, and contradiction and, you know, the difference between antagonistic and non-antagonistic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's that's what it's all about. And it's in those spaces with a lot of different people where you can talk about these things and figure out, okay, so what is our political articulation based off of these critiques, off of these criticisms, which, as you say, Sadia, like they and and Gio, you said this as well, and, and Chris, all of you, you know, there's value in a lot of these critiques. But it doesn't mean that that has to be the end point or that that means that suddenly we have to let go of everything else because, oh, you know, this is patriarchal or there's anti-blackness here or whatever. It's like, OK, how do we how do we use those critiques to deepen our analysis and our articulation rather than, you know, seeking to throw everything out, you know? Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to pull up question, some questions from the chat. And then if we have time, I'll go back. I did have one more, but I think we kind of we kind of covered it. So uh, Claudia had one. Um, Gio, I imagine this probably would be a little bit more to your uh, your backgrounds, but thinking about Martia Guy and uh, the Peruvian context, what do you? How do you see the organizations on the ground now fighting against the U.S. backed regime and their interpretations of his writings, particularly thinking of Fredepa? I don't know if you're familiar with this view, but. Oh, I mean, these are, there's a broad question here about, you know, about Latin American revolutionary traditions, right? And how we understand them and how do we understand our struggles today? Um, and I would, you know, I think one thing is very interesting when I was talking about revolutionary cycles and the way that they sort of landed in the U.S., right? Um, a lot of what we're experiencing now um, begins not completely, but begins again. We had, you know, I was talking about my experience when Oscar Grant was killed in 09, 2010, um, and 2011 is when you begin to have the, you know, the the emergence of the Occupy movement, which is a very complicated movement, but which, you know, seizes space and says we're here over sort of like against neoliberalism, against economic inequality. We see this then 
sort of uh, cycling into and, you know, also influencing and then being sort of, um, you know, uh, overcome in certain ways by um, struggles around, you know, black, you know, black lives, you know, uh, you know, Ferguson and Baltimore. Um, these, you know, these struggles in, in a certain way began in the global South a couple decades earlier, a lot of them, right? Why? Because that's where neoliberalism was tested out, right? Like that's where neoliberalism, the, you know, the, the, the laboratory for neoliberalism starting in Chile in the seventies and then across Latin America in the eighties. And so by the late eighties, you have mass rebellions against neoliberalism that lead to and generate some of the resistance that we see in the forms uh, in the streets, but also in the forms of governments in Bolivia, you know, Chavez in Venezuela, you know, in Ecuador and, and elsewhere. Um, and so a lot of these same cycles and struggles are going through a lot of the same questions. And they're and they're asking the same questions that we all were asking, right? Which is how do we, instead of simply importing a certain kind of framework for understanding what a revolutionary struggle looks like in our country, how do we begin from local traditions, local struggles, local reference points. Um, <clears throat> in Venezuela, there are very interesting things. You know, I, um, I see one of, you know, one of my sort of books up there behind you talks about the ways that in the armed struggle in Venezuela, people were like, we're reading Marx <clears throat> and Lenin and Luxembourg and Gramsci, right? We're also reading Mariategui from Peru. We're also talking about um, specifically Venezuelan things, including cult religions and, you know, um, whether it's kind of like Santeria kind of frameworks along the coast or indigenous traditions and frameworks, you know, in the interior and thinking about all of these as informing and again, infusing what how we understand revolutionary change, right? And giving those pieces, and this is, you know, gets to things that both Saudi and Chris mentioned, giving those pieces like space to breathe, right? Um, instead of shutting them down and saying they have nothing to, to kind of offer, um, you know? And, and so when you look at things like the revolutionary communes in Venezuela today, and you look on the coast in, you know, the, the zone known as Barlovento, which is a heavily traditionally sort of a black zone of the coast in Venezuela, those communes are called cumbes, right? And they um, reflect back on and give reference to maroon communities that existed there, you know, over the centuries prior. And that, you know, infuses their content and makes them into something kind of a little uh, different. That for me is the importance of someone like Mariategui, who's, who's becomes very crucial for Latin America in terms of saying, here's how we start. Again, here's how we start from reality, right? The struggles that are going on across Latin America are very complicated, right? And you have a lot of situations where the right um, is able to tap into divisions between indigenous communities, you know, against each other, div divisions between sort of radicals and indigenous communities over here. The U.S. is always involved. That really um, hasn't changed. Um, but we do have a situation in Latin America where it's like, the potential for a turning point is really um, also very present, right? A center left leader in Mexico and a leftist in power in Colombia are absolutely historic, right? These are, um, you know, elements of, of a transforming, um, you know, uh, um, hegemony across the region. You have a, you know, far right leader in in Argentina, but he's not gonna last very long, right? And 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 the the people are in the streets struggling in Chile and Argentina and all across the region. So, um, again, this is why we need to think about the deep interconnectedness between these questions, right? This is why we need to understand that abolition in the US is also the abolition of ICE, border patrol, and the border, right? And understand the way that the border is one of those carceral structures like the prison, like the plantation that is used to divide workers from each other, to compress them, to control their work conditions, to make them cheaper and easier to control, right? That's what the border does. Um, and the migrant struggles we're dealing with today, including a very rampant migrant hysteria, right? Um, if you watch the news, and a lot of this has to do with Venezuelan migrants right now who are being demonized in the media, um, people attacking cops in New York City, and the first thing you hear on mainstream liberal media is that these are asylum seekers, right? It, that's the most bizarre framing for a news story I've ever heard, right? Like, And the fact that it's a news story is only because it plugs into this right-wing hysteria that the Democrats are also embracing, right? And the Democrats are today embracing in Palestine and at the border, the same kind of hypercarceral uh, reactionary politics. And so we need to be very aware about the fact that those are all connected to each other, in part because the target of this, right, the target of this anti-migrant hysteria in many cases is the Black community and is also established Latinx communities in the U.S., right? The goal is to peel off pieces of those communities for an anti-migrant sort of uh, campaign. Um, and we don't want to be falling into that. Right on. 
I don't know if either of you have anything you want to add on that one, but um, shout out as well. Claudia, who asked that question, um, wrote a recent article on Black Agenda Report. That's the the link for it. But um, so check that out, folks, as well. Um, all right. I'm going to pull in Hiram. Hiram will make it spicy. Um, so uh, how do the panelists balance the teaching of Marxist theory and history um, with the idealism and anarchism so present in current abolitionist movement work and analysis? Damn, Hiram, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I'm going to let someone else answer this one. Yeah, I mean, I'll I, I, I go for it. Certainly, it's the conversation uh, that I also continue with Hiram. So I'm happy he's trying to bring this to the world. Um, and the, the challenge, I think, so one of the things just as being a, a facilitator is to think about the conditions of which you can uh, create the space for um, different um, ways of understanding to be heard and received well. And I think the one of the one of the challenges is sometimes, you know, um, in movement space, we have to give space for folks to learn the hard way. And what I mean the hard way is sometimes seeing things not end up the way that they do. And then a space of collective reflection where we're so important to kind of like think through the forces and um, um, and our own internal visions that have led to us to make the choices that we made. You come, it, it allows the space for us to like reflect and think about, you know, unlearning or learning new practices. Uh, I think it's very hard um to uh, to any space to say like what a proper line is right there's it's such a, a dynamic uh discipline so the question for me rather than uh becomes rather than what the balance is it's like what are our ways of teaching critical reflection right um that both um focus on marxist principles but as geo mentioned and going back to cesare are rich with the particulars of of, 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 you know, uh, an understanding of reality. And I think it's certainly a challenge that I don't know if we have a, a, a playbook for, like, I don't think there's, there's something, but I think in building the sort of like comradely relationships and also setting the conditions for principal struggle and Tanya Lee from Left Roots and so many other things is such a, a huge uh, voice for me in terms of what principal struggle looks like. Um, but in building those conditions in a sense of relationship, a sense of solidarity and supportiveness that even if um, this experiment, you know, doesn't lead to where we want it to go, I'm still willing to commit to be in formation or in, uh, in, in this organization with you to figure out what's next. And I think sometimes you have to think about the, the long game of what it means to like build resilient, reflective, um, organizations develop around principal struggle. Um, and certainly as abolition school, this is our, you know, what, a year, year and a half in, uh, we're figuring out what that looks like on the ground in terms of our organization, but certainly through all of us and our different movement experiences, we kind of learn a bit more of like um, mixing the opportunity to sort of engage with um, the importance of, of, of theory and and, and, and principal analysis with a bit of the emergent experience that colors those things. Um, and that's like the the art of the whole thing, you know, it's uh, it's definitely a, a, a challenge and would love to hear from others on, on this work as well. And certainly there's a community of, of, of folks like, how do we do, what does, uh, we can look at historical, you know, periods, look at what does sort of like uh, transformative political education look like in practice. And as always involved, and, and importance is always involved practice, as involved people putting their bodies in themselves on the line and then using that as a point of reflection. And I don't think that you can just uh, prescribe anything before engaging in such activities. The deposits, the, the connections, the connective tissue isn't there, you know. Um, have a conversation at, like that outside uh, doing jail support. Right. 
I think you you in a different type of uh, conditions for that than saying, you know, what does it mean um, from the space of just like an open conversation? So I was just thinking more of like the conditions by which you can come to that. Um, yeah, but certainly a conversation we should keep going. I'll just say quickly, full disclosure, Hiram is also a member of y'all advisory board too. So oh, yeah, that's too. <laughs> like, like folks that, you know, it's a comradely discussion as well, right? So yeah, that's true. That's real. Yeah. I think um I really appreciate this question because I think I was just talking to a friend about this the other day. And I think at least the way I'm interpreting this question, I think something we and I individually often navigate in doing abolitionist work is the contradiction of to the point about, you know, balancing the teaching of Marxist theory and idealism and anarchism. I think on the idealism piece, I think I often hear criticisms around sort of blending of abolition and Marxist theory and teaching within sort of like social, social justice, nonprofit sort of organizing structures versus sort of what we saw in the 60s and 70s where there were fully grassroots revolutionary parties that could teach communism and Marxism in a way that was very much separate and um, I think agitating of the state versus more of sort of like a blending. I think my response to that, and I hope I'm answering this the way that it, it was meant in the question, but I feel like there's, a, there's often a community of folks who identify as anarchists, which I think is amazing and beautiful, um, I see the, you know, looking at Kowasi Balagoon, right, a political prisoner who talked about like black anarchism as a strategy feels really important and crucial in movement. Um, I think there's a thing to name about, you know, the idealist and anarchist vision of like, you know, you can't build certain things under, you know, quote unquote, uh, nonprofit, social justice, movement oriented, uh, revolutionary oriented organizations. And I think, at least for me, it feels, it feels, that criticism feels very idealist um, or it feels like sometimes there's a, and I don't want to say that anarchists are solely responsible for this. I think it's a, across the board in socialism and communism where folks, there's always a criticism of something not being quote unquote fully, you know, revolutionary or as ideal in its nature of being purely, you know, et cetera, et cetera, grassroots, revolutionary, radical. And I think there's a thing sometimes where I think what's what's frustrating is that we see, you know, the alt-right and like Republican fascists in terms of like how they strategize to dismantle a lot of our movements being very clear on like their spectrum of fascism and how they serve it. There's the Biden formula, which is nice and nasty. There's the Trump, which is explicitly nasty. There's the, you know, all the all the folks. And I think for us, sometimes within movement and folks who engage in Marxism, study, practice theory, what does it mean to build working class power? What does it mean to look at sort of his analysis of looking at factories versus um, looking at like George Jackson, right? Folks who, you know, Gio, you've talk, talked about this in abolition school, folks who looked at folks who were the lumpen proletariat, right? The folks who are engaging in uh, radical self-survival work to make money, who weren't working a nine-to-five job. Um, and that created more complex, I think, conversations around the kind of abolitionist work that they were doing. Um, I think it's I think it's very difficult when it feels like there's a very um, almost like Puritan or like there has to be like, there's always a criticism about what folks on the left who engage in anar anarchism or abolition aren't doing enough of. You're not doing enough of this. You're not talking enough about this. You're getting funding or money from this. And I think, sure, that's fair criticism that doesn't necessarily feel fully antagonistic. And we live in a nonprofit industrial complex. Like we know that the fully grassroots revolutionary parties that existed and some of the nonprofits that are, were also started around the 60s, that that's just the terrain that we are in. And I think if folks are carrying a genuine um, and a deeply connected commitment to revolutionary work, you know, if you're doing a table, right, and you're tabling and you're able to talk about a Marxist theory and maybe naming Marxism isn't the first step, but you give out the theory to build with people, then I think sort of that's the way I, I try to balance the teaching. And, and I think we do is like um, 
trying to think who said it. Was it Malcolm X who said, like, make it plain for folks? Make the work and the movement, you know, you should be able to talk to your grandma, your auntie, your cousin, that person in the back of the church who you know supported, you know, Obama or whatever political leaders that aren't um, fully aligned clearly with our revolutionary party and analysis. You're supposed to make it as plain as possible for people to understand. And I think I, no one's ideal or perfect. And I think while I appreciate those sort of criticisms that come from that uh, purview, I think it's not realistic for how you meet people, right? You're not going to meet the average person who's fully removed from movement spaces, fully removed from, you know, deep, complex theory. And to be like, do you know Marxism? Are you ready to, you know what I mean? Like we have to make things conversational through relationship building with people. And I think that's how we try to balance it. Um, I hope I answered that question right. Byron will probably tell me later if I did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I, I think for me, the question is more about the idealism than the anarchism, which I feel like other people have already said too, right? Which is, you know, I mean, there's, there's revolutionary anarchists, revolutionary anarchists believe that the struggle begins where the people are at, begins by generating a mass movement. You know, <clears throat> we agree on all of these things. And then there's anarchists, but also many others um, who, uh, you know, take refuge in tiny groupings that accomplish nothing and that don't care about connecting with people, right? And would rather feel pure about their politics than actually build mass struggle, right? But again, there's Trotskyists that do that. There's communists, many communists that act exactly the same way because they have the correct line, right? And they don't um, they don't feel the need, they feel good about having the correct line and, and don't need to connect to actual people. So the question for me that Hiram is raising is much more about this idealist piece. And I think it, you know, it has at least two different kind of meanings or, or, or pieces, right? One is about the question of transition and one is about the question of what abolition itself means or would, uh, you know, or would look like. Um, you know, on like what it would look like, one of the really important pieces about the idealism for me is that there's a tendency, and again, this overlaps with anarchism, but it's not the same thing as, as, as anarchism. There's this tendency to think and to act as if communities are ready to take care of themselves and protect themselves without, you know, uh, any sort of building or development, whether it's ideological development, but also like without, you know what I mean? Like there's this idea that if you just take the police out of communities, everything's going to be good. And that's absolutely a fucking lie, right? Like that's not true, right? And, and also it's a barrier to mass movements because people... Um, if you go down the block right here and, and, and ask people if we should just withdraw the police unilaterally from communities, their immediate response is probably going to be no, right? Why? Because we have a world that's built around policing and we have a world in which the police are mistakenly or not understood as the only possible safety, right? And so there's just so that's a statement about the re, uh, the way the world is, right? And about what people think about that world. And both of those pieces, I think, are crucial for working through this, right? This is very similar to for you know people that do like theory and philosophy stuff. It's like similar to like when Foucault is critiquing Freud on the repressive hypothesis, right? This idea that like the problem is repression, right? When Foucault's response is no, no, the problem is that like in hand in hand with that repression is the fact that we been created and we are being reconstructed every day like we're made into a certain kind of people by the world that we live in right we need to be remaking ourselves and we remake ourselves i think uh kind of collectively we need to be building communities that are strong and able to protect themselves and a lot of ways that this critique comes out is the idea that like abolitionists who aren't anarchists who want to build power um are just want a different kind of policing right um, and here's where I think it's really important to understand that like the police is a very specific kind of formation, right? It's a professional, um, you know, body of violence workers that stand outside and above the community, right? If you, if the community themselves arm themselves to defend themselves, this is not policing, right? This is simply just a very, very different thing. In many ways, it's the opposite of policing. But there's people for whom that kind of reads as like, oh, that's just more repression, right? Like, it's just the community doing the repressing versus the police. No, these are completely different things. And I think, you know, at least speaking for myself, I sort of unabashedly believe that people need to be defending themselves, right? And that's why abolition needs to be reconnected with the long trajectory of black self-defense, right? The long struggles for, you know, community power and what that looks like. Um, so that's one piece, right? What does abolition look like 
it's about you know collectively coming together and rebuilding ourselves and recreating but it, it means building power it doesn't mean rejecting power it doesn't mean rejecting any kind of uh, coercion if you want to call it that because you know what there's people that need to have hard conversations about whether or not they're bringing violence into communities right like there's hard conversations that need to happen about the drug trade there's hard conversations that need to happen about harm within the community right and that requires a power an alternative power to be built to be able to do that right um on the transition piece i mean it's in some ways it's very much tied into that right which is there's an idealism of thinking that we that getting from here to there is not going to be an incredibly difficult dangerous process right you know um and this can look different ways it can look you know again kind of anarchisty it can look very liberal right it can look like the abolition that says um that abolition is a kind of ethical principle where we're opposed to all um sort of prisons opposed again to all kinds of coercion or policing um and this leads to these conversations that people have seen right about you know well what do we think about cops going to jail it doesn't bother me all that much right because cops going to jail again dialectically understood cops going to jail is not the same thing as young teenagers from communities of color going to jail these are opposites right jails were not made for you know cops and the more cops that go to jail maybe the closer we get to abolition right in, in a certain kind of sense but i i raise it just to say the question of like that you know like we need to think about what it means to transition toward abolition right we are not in a position we are obligated to build and we're not in a position to be able to refuse small reforms or small changes um, simply because they're small, right? We may refuse them, you know, as Mariam Kaba and others have helped us sort of like focus in on good and bad reforms, right? Potentially beneficial ones versus ones that reinforce the system. Like those are the decisions, right? The decision is not simply like this isn't abolition yet, therefore it's not good enough, right? Um, we need to think very, very hard about what it would look like to, you know, to engage in change now. Right, whether it's drawing resources back out of city, you know, from city administrations, defunding, defunding the police, getting the police, pushing them out of communities as much as possible, um, but understanding that is a process of transition that's going to be a hard process. And again, it connects with the other piece because it's because it, it requires a power, right? It requires a force. It requires community collective struggle to come together and to build that power. Yeah, great answers, all of you, um, and. I do think, I mean, Hiram had said a couple other things in the chat, but I do think he was also, you know, thinking partly at the level of theory, too, of just like kind of how do you balance, you know, teaching Marxism to a folks that come from a movement that is often not embedded in a Marxist tradition currently. Um, and maybe I think also I did it and I think a lot of people a tendency to lump because he bracketed it as like anarchism and idealism of of also wanting to talk about those things slightly separately from one another you know although obviously there's there's idealism within a lot of different organizations but um and tendencies let's pull up so here's another one we'll bring up this question so can the guests reflect on how organizers can keep elders and disabled organizers supported Thinking about Claudia Jones, Rosa Parks, Paul Glover, who were mostly left alone, um, and our political prisoners need more, of course. Obviously, there's like a character limit when you write in these questions, so I'm sure they had more that they wanted to say on that. But um, yeah, this this topic, does anybody have any thoughts they want to share on this? Yeah, uh, well, a couple things. Um... One, you know, we gave a shout out to the mobilization from Amia earlier, but certainly in terms of like uh, the work of, you know, Philadelphia, like the Philadelphia organizers and some of our, you know, longest standing uh, organizations and you know, the work that like Maroon started with the Human Rights Coalition, the, the presence of the long struggle in Philadelphia uh, is made every day. They walk that road through a numerous events education opportunities, ways of translating uh, the work of even Maroon or Mumia. And, and the Mumia does an amazing job to this day of always like responding and, and having an ongoing conversation with movements. And it's been uh, just an am amazing to see the ways in which we do have to honor and cherish um, and, and uplift the interventions that so many of our political prisoners have made that have allowed us the space to kind of continue on in this work. And I think about 
there is that role of, you know, the like, for example, the memory work lab that we have, right? This sort of like focus on black memory and revolutionary memory. Like there's this imp importance of how do we begin to always layer these histories into any one moment? Um, and how do we continue to uplift the names and the fight to free political prisoners as part of our everyday struggle? Um, and certainly, um, you know, uh, you know, Saudia and I have been around to see letter writing, can't, like uh, activities and days that have been put together around Philadelphia to introduce people uh, to some of our political uh, prisoners and to establish some forms of connection. Um, that is work that, you know, we all must, you know, take on to be able to have this legacy because like you said, the, 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 the forces of oppression are always trying to create this amnesia, right, around uh, movement struggle that uh, this period is, is the first period in which we have ever confronted these contradictions. But certainly uh, the work of our political prisoners reminds us of the long historical struggle. And it's important that we continue to, you know, create formations such as like um, in Philly, we got the alumni of the Black Panther Party, right? Uh, who are continuing to do events and activities and, and pulling folks together. Uh, Paula Peeble, Peebles, uh, who just transitioned to Ancestor recently, had a, we had an amazing home going. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, one of our partners decolonized Philly, um, held an event at um, uh, the Rotunda in West Philadelphia. One of the people who was there, uh, and Gabe Bryant and Yane were uh, part of bringing him there. The, the son of Seku uh, Odinga was there and offered testimony, right? And this is like, uh, you look out into the audience, these are, you know, uh, a number of 20-somethings, right, uh, who are coming into movement from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, but the importance of, like you said, like that presence of this history, the presence that we are still fighting for those who are with us right now, but also those who are locked behind, our, our freedom is, you know, intertwined. Like that, those things being part of how we do actions, how those names are lifted up. Uh, how the sort of like continuance of propaganda and posters and zines that continue to lift up this history. That is also the part of how we build a, a beautiful intergenerational movement. Um, and um, yeah, so I don't know, I guess just what comes to me from what was offered. Yeah, I will add that in addition to what Chris said, I think because the question, right, was about what can folks do to support uh, elders, uh, disabled folks, political prisoners coming to mind. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, great groups form committees specifically for particular political prisoners and elders, which has been a great strategy. Um, I think Kamal Siddiqui just turned 71 the other day or this week. Uh, and there's a campaign to free Kamal Siddiqui, right? Someone we know as a political prisoner, uh, very similar to a lot of the Black Liberation Army veterans that we know who committed his life, right, to supporting folks. Um, what I see a lot, especially in Philadelphia, is that often communities will form committees where they can contact a political prisoner by connecting to their loved ones and their family, building a relationship there, asking their family like, hey, what does this elder need? Do they need letter writing like Chris mentioned? Folks have formed letter writing parties virtually during um, during COVID, especially right when we know the prisons went on lockdown and stopped families from getting in-person access. Um, folks will organize committees to uh, strategize around legal support, trying to find the right lawyer or the right legal defense. There will be folks who form health committees, right? We see this uh, great example with uh, mobilization from EMEA, right? Where folks literally form committees around different elders' needs inside. Um, and it's really important. I'm glad this person brought up this question, right? Because we see, we've seen so many Black Panther veterans and Black Liberation Army veterans come out in the last six months to a year. And a lot of them have passed away within six months of being released, which is a part of the strategy from the state, right? Keep them in the prison for as long as possible until they know that their um, lifespan will be very limited once they come out. Um, so we see folks organizing for Kamal Siddiqui. Uh, we've seen it from Amia for Russell Maroon Schultz. Uh, I think of folks um, like Ed Poindexter, who I don't think 
uh, had as much support as he could get and probably could have had a lot more if more folks knew how to support, where to plug in. And he unfortunately passed away last year after experiencing a lot of medical neglect um, from the prison he was in. So it's a great question. I say just form committees and get in touch with people's families on what support looks like. Yeah. And, you know, just building on that a little bit, but echoing some things that people said already, I think, um, I mean, the principle is incredibly important, right? Like these are, you know, soldiers trapped behind enemy lines. None should be left behind. None should be abandoned. And while we have a broader understanding of abolition, right, like all prisoners are political prisoners, we also have a very specific understanding of the role of political prisoners as, you know, um, you know, as members of a revolutionary community and also as, um, you know, I mean, Maroon was an educator. He was radicalizing many people behind bars. He was doing incredible um, work, um, you know, the, uh, you know, right up until, you know, his his release. And, and there's a, and I also want to uplift the legal work um, that is necessary, even, you know, even in this very sort of tragic and sad kind of way, right? Whether it's Matulu Shakur, or, uh, you know, or Russell Maroon shows like the people doing the work that's like really just like thankless work to make sure that people come home, even if it's only to spend a few weeks or a couple of months with their families, right? Like, I think that's just an incredibly important work that Abolitionist Law Center and, and others are trying to do. Um, and, you know, we're coming, and it's important to understand, we're coming to the end of an era, right? Where an entire wave of revolutionary political prisoners are coming to the end of their lives, right? And I think that's a commitment that needs to be upheld in particular. And it's a commitment, of course, that needs to be upheld for our current political prisoners and Smith and, and, and many, many uh, others moving forward. Much appreciated to all of you. Um, let's, so one, I just wanna draw folks again, like this is the website if you wanna find out more. Also, I think that's the, the at on all the relevant social media too um and uh so you know please follow around their work if you're in philadelphia um you know get involved um and uh yeah i don't know if there's anything else that you all want to add or say kind of in closing much appreciate the conversation and um look forward to you know continuing it at another point yeah i'll just say you know we got we went through one full semester in the fall. Um, it was incredibly successful. It was so invigorating and encouraging. And, it, you know, the team gelled. We did amazing work. We had so many amazing and incredible students who were on the front lines of particularly Palestine organizing, but other organizing. And as a result of that, we got like 200 applications to study this spring. It's way more than we could accommodate, but we're doing our best to, to bring as many people into this study. So please pay attention to future, um, you know, work, whether it's events um, that will be sponsoring throughout the spring or whether it's sort of summer opportunities to study um, please plug in please follow us please um, donate at evolutionschool.org backslash donate of course to support the work um, because we really survive you know at, at the mercy of uh, this sort of nonprofit funding structure so um, any individual donations and support that we can get is also incredibly um, appreciated I'll, I'll just add on to that to say uh, knowing the community of folks who listen and engage with millennials are killing capitalism. Certainly in the Philadelphia area, uh, it us, but then also part of the abolition school network is it has a sort of like presence. Uh, we are very happy to be able to support and co-sponsor uh, events and conversations and ways of gathering that are aligned with our principles. Uh, really excited about one coming up. Uh, alongside the, you know, uh, our Communist Party chapter region here in the city. Uh, Sharice Burton, Steli, and um, Joy James are coming together, um, having a conversation at Making World's Bookstore, uh, working on see if we can get a virtual option to stream that. Uh, like, we're really excited about continuing to also be a, like a, a linkage, a part of a circuit, you know what I mean, of these sort of political education spaces. We're also always on the lookout for partners um, we're figuring out as we build our capacity what partnership means. Um, and I was like, part of this too is also learning from the other experiments around radical political education that are taking place. Um, so please continue to reach out, engage. Uh, really excited to kind of continue to build this in that community. And as Gio mentioned, it's an internationalist community. So not just thinking about, you know, sites within the US but uh, across the uh, global south as well. 
uh, that we're seeking to be in community with. So, um, you know, get in touch with us, please. And yeah, the only thing, I, my final comment, I'm grateful to be on this platform and grateful for the opportunity to join comrades in this conversation. It's been amazing. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't name uh, folks as we talk about folks who are engaged in active abolition work, right? Much of my political development is owed to some of the orgs I mentioned. I also have to mention the Alliance for Educational Justice. Folks should keep an eye out for young people in Oakland, Chicago, Miami, New York, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, right? Youth organizations that are fighting to get police removed from their schools. Um, so I invite folks to look at uh, at the number four Ed Justice on Instagram to follow those campaigns, support them, because a lot of this, you know, we talked about the past, the present, what's happening now. And we see our babies, right, the future organizing to get police out of school. So that's my final word uh, and just grateful for the, the conversation. Grateful for the conversation as well. And yeah, again, thank you all for your time and for sharing the work that you all are doing and your analysis and answering some some great questions from the chat as well. Shout out to the chat, folks engaging there. Um, and yeah, it'll be up on our YouTube channel. So make sure to share it with other folks and get folks connected to what you all are doing. All right. Thanks a lot.